is heading up to the code 3 chase. Suspect was last reported southbound on Highway 99. Can you give me more info on that call? Greetings. I'm Brian Tuscan, host of Cop to Corporate. Today's special guest is Peter J. O'Neill, who is the CEO of ASIS International for the past five years. And before we get to Peter, I just want to personally talk about my story about ASIS International. I first heard of them about 21 years ago when I was a detective for the Redmond Police Department. And I'd never heard of ASIS until I was awarded with a Detective of the Year Award from the Puget Sound chapter. So ASIS International has many local chapters. So I went to a luncheon, got the award, and my chief was there, Chief Stephen Harris. Uh, Steve was a huge proponent of the public-private partnership when he was the chief of police for uh, Redmond. Uh, he was also the IACP, so International Association of Chiefs of Police president during the 1992-1993 uh, session. And Steve always talked about the importance of having public-private partnerships. That was his mantra when I was an officer and a detective at the Redmond Police Department. And so I did a little more research and I ended up joining over 20 years ago. And it was the best thing I've ever done because it helped me expand my experiences outside of law enforcement, but into the private security and integration sector. And so when I give my uh, followers and pe people coaching advice from cop to corporate, I always say you should look at industries, uh, industry associations and ASIS is top of my list. So without further ado, Peter, please tell us a little about the association and how are you making it uh, more amenable to law enforcement so they can bridge that gap from the private security side and public safety? Sure, thank you very much for having me, Brian. You're a great example of someone who chose to make a, a transition from um, law enforcement specifically to the corporate side. And I think you and I both would recognize and agree that not everybody in law enforcement makes that choice, right? Some choose to stay, stay in law enforcement for their entire careers and retire and, and kind of go off into their next sort of post-retirement life. No harm, no foul. Others, and you and I have talked to a lot of these folks, probably you more than me over my last five years, um, which, uh, but some start to question at some point in their law enforcement career, what's next? What might be next for me? And when they talk to folks like you and they talk to folks like me, what we say is this. There are organizations like ASIS, a global organization that represents security management professionals, where we help law enforcement bridge the gap between their career in law enforcement and their next life, perhaps in corporate, um, but let's call it outside of, of, um, of law enforcement in some security management capacity. And there are a number of ways we do that. I mean, first and foremost, we're a community of 34,000 practitioners globally um, who are practicing in all facets of security management, whether it's in utilities or it's in banking or it's in technology or whatever it may be. We're very fortunate that we have folks that practice in all these various facets of the profession. And we're also very fortunate as most associations are that folks like you, Brian, and the 34,000 others that we have are willing to share their experiences, their documentation, um, uh, the lessons learned from potentially, you know, uh, physical security breaches or cyber security breaches. And so we're very fortunate in that way. So, for example, we have, I think right now, something in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 online communities. And as a member of ASIS, you can join as many or all of those as you want. There are a couple of exceptions. One or two are closed for different reasons, but but I'm mostly correct. And it's an opportunity for somebody who's um, either making the transition from law enforcement to corporate or to say non-law enforcement, um, uh, or who's been practicing the way you have, Brian, in this in the, the corporate sphere for, for a decade or so or longer to network with your global peers. Hey, today we experienced X, who out there has experienced this? And boom, you know, within seven minutes, you have all these people saying, oh, this was our experience and these were the resources we used. So I would say that a piece about around community. And then the other piece I would talk about, and I think this is an important point, which is this notion of lifelong learning. So 
I grew up the son of a, of a senior investigator with the Bureau of Criminal Investigation in New York State. And my dad passed years and years ago, um, relatively young, uh, of cancer, nothing related to the job. But I've been in and around that cop, you know, the law enforcement world for my whole life. My mom was the chief court clerk uh, in, the, in the city, in the region, in St. Lawrence County, where I lived, where I grew up. And so, you know, we all know people in, in law enforcement who want to be lifelong learners. And we all know people in every profession, including law enforcement, who don't. But for those who say, hey, there's something better, different, more out there for me, when you join an organization like ASIS, you not only have access to the communities I was mentioning and so forth earlier, but you have act, direct access to lifelong learning, whether you choose, choose to become certified, to demonstrate competence, to help show your bosses or your peers that you've really committed to the profession and you've, there's a third party that has acknowledged that you know the things that you know. Um, whether it's using the ASIS learning management system, so-called learning, uh, the learning exchange, where we have hundreds of asynchronous programs across every aspect of security management. It really gives somebody who's making that leap between what you say cop to corporate, an understanding of the broad swath of, well, what does security management practice look like? And I may have an interest in this, but not in that. So I think those are the things that an organization like ASIS International brings to um, the law enforcement uh, transition to corporate. Well, I didn't know you had a connection to law enforcement. And so yeah. th thanks for mentioning that. And that, that'll welcome. help That'll help a little with the street cred with, with the audience here because <laughs> the police- really... need as much street cred as I can get. <laughs> what, what I wanted to tell uh, the cop to corporate followers out there, in law enforcement, the- the premier industry association is the IACP. As I talked about, uh, my former chief was the president. The IACP has, I believe, about 31,000 members globally, and it's open beyond for just chiefs. Uh, some people don't know that. You can have associate membership, a general membership, not even being in law enforcement, but tied somehow to law enforcement. And I wanted to just show the comparison where you have a purely public safety law enforcement association that's very helpful. You have huge events. You have the Police Chief Magazine that's very helpful. And I, I've been a member of IACP for 20 years. Switch over to the ASIS uh, International, very similar, right? But specific to that security practitioner. And as Peter, as you mentioned, the, the one of the greatest benefits is that benchmarking. And you have this 34,000 people that you could go out to and specifically whatever vertical you're working in. So when you go to cop to corporate and maybe you're working in oil, gas or banking and you have a particular problem, you do not have to reinvent the wheel because a lot of uh, law enforcement that go into the private sector feel like I am on my own. I really am out of my element. I don't have exactly. S SOPs, MOUs. Well, you go out to the constituency and these communities uh, and you can get you can get that help. And so if, if you could expand a little more specifically on how the communities work and how to become a part of it, uh, there, there is there is a membership fee. And I just want to let everybody out there know I'm not getting a cut or anything of this. This is really to give back. <laughs> you know, there's there's cynical people out there. I mean, I do this. For, this is a labor of sure. love. And I, I, when I coach and mentor anyone, I say, get into the industry uh, memberships. Uh, you, you've heard Brian Reich, who uh, I interviewed on my first podcast. He talked about the ASIS and, and the communities and councils that he was on. So could you talk a little more about that? And then the other tools, such as the, the magazine and industry events. I know this year was 100% virtual, sure. but as we get uh, post-COVID, what is that future going to look like? Sure. So that's big. So I'm going to try to answer it all. And if you want me to dive deep into any of it, you tell me and I'll do that. So you're right. There's a membership fee, right? And we are a uh, IRS, U.S. recognized IRS 501c6, but I'm fond of saying no margin, no mission. So we are a membership fee-based organization. 195 U.S. dollars gets you an annual membership. It's a calendar year membership. So put that out there. Um, ASIS is staffed. Um, our headquarters, corporate um, global headquarters is in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside DC. 
Um, we do have an office in Brussels, a team of about five people that serve um, different parts of the world for us out of that office. And we have at any given time between 60 and 90 staff at HQ, subject matter experts in all the things they've got to be subject matter expert in, experts in, in order to deliver quality products and services. The most important part of that is that we have to partner with people like Brian and Brian, right? And many, many, many others. We have... At any given time, we are working globally with 1,800 to 2,400 volunteers for their subject matter expertise so that when we provide a product or service or we provide a webinar or we provide live events, which I'll talk about in a minute, we know it's by peers for peers. We know it's not commercial. Yes, we charge fees to attend some, well, all of our live events come with the fee. Some of our virtual events are free. Some are not. Some come with the fee. But that's because we have to be able to take that money and invest it back into the organization. And it becomes one of those cyclical um, financially uh, able to a way to able to financially feed the organization. Uh, we have a large annual meeting uh, pre COVID about 20,000 rotates different cities, three or four cities around the, the United States. And the beauty of any live meeting is exactly Brian, what you've used to your advantage for the last 10 or 20 years, which is live networking. It's that connection point with a peer who understands you. Your wife, you might think your wife or partner understands what you do. You'd like your kids to understand what you do. You'd wish your mom would understand what you do, your dad. But the people who really understand that are other practitioners. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, whether you attend a live meeting at a chapter, so globally we, we service about 270 chapters. So whether you choose to go to the Puget Sound meeting once a month or once a quarter, whatever it may be, and interact with local uh, local peers, that, that's great. You have an opportunity to interact nationally in the United States um, at, for example, our annual meeting in September, October timeframe called Global Security Exchange or GSX. Um, whether you practice, you know, Brian, you're working for a large multinational company. We've got meetings on the European continent. We've got meetings in the uh, Middle East. We have live events in Asia PAC. So it may be, Brian, that next year, uh, this year and next year, you say, oh, gosh, we're doing so much more work in Europe. I've got to get over there. And, hey, I'll tie my trip to an ASIS Europe event. And I'll attend, you know, uh, well thought of programs by peers. Oh, and, hey, I'll also get my corporate work done, right? So a lot of different opportunities for folks to participate in that way. And maybe the last quick point I'll make to that, and then if you want me to dive deeper, I will. <laughs> my parents always taught me their safety in numbers. You know, and be like, well, when you go out, take Jimmy or, hey, you know, you're going to go with Brian. You know, you better take Steve with you, too, you know, because our parents, you know, always believe you know, you're, you're you're safer together, so to speak. And I really think that's true for an association, whether it's ASIS, it's IACP, a great organization. I have enormous respect for Vince Tolucci, their CEO uh, and the work, the really, really good work that IACP does. Um, but it's safety in numbers. And you mentioned it a minute ago, Brian, like, why go it alone? You're almost any challenge Brian is faced with today, right, at Microsoft is going to be not that much different than what somebody over in Europe, say, Werner Coleman, Corman is experiencing um, in the Netherlands. And so I think there's a way there to, um, to network with one another and, and uh, be better together, so to speak. Thanks, Peter. The other thing you just touched on uh, when, when you opened up were certifications and the, the main, I would say the gold standard certification of ASIS International is the CPP, which is the Certified Protection Professional. And I right. don't have my, I don't have my CPP. I, I just want to let everyone know it is not an easy certification to get. It's not something you just sign up for and you take a quick test and get it. There's very immense study materials and uh, they actually have uh, volunteer study groups. And I, I have it on my list to do my to do list, but I, I just wanted in 2021, <laughs> well, I'm not going to commit to that on, on record, but <laughs> I'm going to uh, be talking to you after this, <laughs> but, but I, I have a, a lot of people on my team on, on, on my corporate side that are RCPPs, PCIs, and, and have these de designations. And what it, what it shows is they went out there, they did the study material, they, they uh, had the, the commitment to get these skills. So if you could talk about the certifications and how the process works and uh, continuing credits, sure. just so they have an idea. 
Sure. So I won't bore you with my, my, all the certification knowledge I have. So I'll talk again at about a high level. And if you want me to dive anywhere, please do. So let me generally say this about certifications. Um, certifications in general, no matter the profession, but including the profession, the security profession is a measurement of experience and knowledge. You, to your point, Brian, it's not like being in college or back in high school where you memorize a certain number of equations or a certain number of concepts, you take a test and you're done. It's not it, right? So part of the difference between the certification and say some sort of certificate or other education program any of us might've attended in our lives is that the competency demonstration, which a good certification gets at, um, really measures experience, All right? That's really important. And so I'll say that too, we have four certifications an inch, what we call a, a, you know, largely call an entry level certification, the APP. It's an associate certified uh, practitioner um, exam. A lot of folks who are coming into the profession relatively early, and that doesn't mean that they're young, quote unquote, it may mean a law enforcement professional in their late 30s, early 40s, even late 40s, early 50s, come into the security side and want to start that, that certification process. Often they go to the APP, and we can talk more about that if you want. Every certification is true for us. It's true for certification. General, there's minimum qualifications. So for example, with the CPP, and we've just changed our um, eligibility requirements, um, now you must have, and I can be corrected on this, and our website, asisonline.org, can trump me on this, what I'm about to say. Um, right now, the new eligibility requirements from January forward are that it's five years of work experience, pardon me, seven years of work experience, no undergraduate degree five years of work experience with an undergraduate degree. Again, asisonline.org can, can trump me if I said that wrong. So all of these certifications have requirements and minimum requirements to meet before you can sit. The last thing I'll say about this is ASIS has a lot of certification preparation, so-called cert prep support. Chapters, Brian, to your point, run study groups, um, there are national consulting companies that you pay money to and you can go through their study group. We have just come out and uh, will come out shortly with, I think our third or fourth, I think by the middle to end of this year, we will have cert prep guides for every certification we have. Why we didn't have them before another discussion. But la maybe the last, last thing I'll say about certification, and I'm gonna say it directly to you, Brian, <laughs> but I'm gonna say it to all your listeners. Please don't let the fear or the concern that an exam is too hard or there's too much prep time. Don't let that stand in your way. There's more than some people think to it. And there's a lot less than what other people think to it. And I do think in this, in the security space that I've been in, in the last five years, I think sometimes there's a folklore that lives around the CPP that I'm not sure is entirely accurate. Um, the CPP exam is a balanced, psychometrically sound exam. If a person has done some level of preparation, I'm not, most people cannot sign up for the exam, walk in and pass it. I mean, those people exist. I actually know one who did this. I won't say who, um, but most people like you and I, Brian, and, and our, your listeners, they're going to have to do some prep, right? And some people take a year to prep. We've all heard those stories, Brian, that we know that. I know as many people that took a few months to prep and they went in and took the exam. And sometimes they were successful the first time and sometimes they weren't. But don't let, don't let the folklore around this exam for your listeners or for you stop you from trying because it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it and they, it wouldn't be a platinum certification, but it's a, it's a totally attainable thing. In 2021 for you, Brian, we're going to talk. Oh, I, boy, you, you got to be encouraged there. And I, I'm glad you brought that up, but the, the old folklore, but I, I would also like to say, because it's not easy, right? Not, not, nothing's uh, mm -hmm. worth worthwhile getting. Uh, it, it's not easy. And so you just have to apply yourself. And so it's really me that had, had those mm -hmm. uh, obstructions. And so you, you've given me the uh, inspiration but I, I do feel when I have people working for me or in the industry that have the CPP, you just immediately go, oh, okay, that I, I respect that certification. And for my mm -hmm. listeners out there, there, there are a lot of security CSOs and directors in the industry that require 
that for certain positions, uh, just, just, and you're seeing it more and more and you're going to, yeah, yeah. You're seeing it more and more. So you'll see that on applications. If you didn't know, well, what is a CPP? Well, now, now, you know, so as, as we, uh, wrap up this really great interview, Peter, I, I want to touch on the, uh, diversity and an inclusion, uh, work that ASIS has been doing because the police, uh, I would say industry or public safety and in the private security is really male dominated, right? Police is, I think is you have 12% uh, percent women uh, that, that are police officers over the last time I checked uh, in, in the private security sector, probably about the same, but I've seen some really great initiatives, uh, ASIS women in security and other organizations. Could you talk a little about uh, you, your, your diversity and inclusion for uh, the expanding the, the diversity within sure. ASAS. Sure. So for the five years that I have been at ASIS, we have from a culture, staff culture, and I think an organization member culture perspective, embraced the, the values, if you will, around diversity, equity, and inclusion, so-called DE&I. And I recognize from the events from last year, you know, in particular, that's become even more heightened for a lot of folks. For ASIS, that's a daily journey that we, we're on. And I look from a personal practitioner association executive perspective, but also on behalf of the security management profession, because this is my day job right now, um, every day, how do we bring in and honor the principles of DEI such that ASIS can be successful? And there is visible diversity of gender, an obvious gender maybe an obvious guess from where a person might come from because of the color of their skin, a brown person or a black person, for example. But there is equally invisible diversity. You know, do we have represent representatives from Europe and Asia PAC on a particular task force, for example? Brian, you participated in, in some strategic planning with ASIS now, what, three, we've gone on four years now, 2021, and we took great pains to make sure the people in that room were different. They looked different in some cases, but there was invisible diversity that everyone in the room might not have understood, but we did because we made sure to have those represent those representations there. So that DEI commitment for ASIS has been there, at least during my tenure, not only for me and my staff team, but 100% from your board of directors. Um, we had a great program, gosh, is it last month, December? Yes, gosh, it's no, January already. Um, actually, as you know, uh, Microsoft, Brian, was our, our sponsor, and we held a, a program, a DEI program. We had over 720 people sign up for this program, and that to me says a lot. We have a DEI community within the ASIS communities I was speaking of earlier. I think we have in the neighborhood of 180 or 220 or so people who within 48 to 72 hours signed up for that community. These are people saying, in effect, we want to have dialogue about this. We want to learn from each other. We want to understand what resources do you have and do you have and do you have so that we, maybe I back at my office can pull them all together and say, okay, these aspects of what you shared are what I need. So um, I think DE&I has a bottom line impact on both society and on the bottom line of a corporation or an association. And the manner in which we go about it, I think, has to be genuine and authentic to me, to Peter O'Neill, and I think to ASIS's board leadership and our staff team, this isn't a check the box exercise. This isn't a, oh, we have 10 spots, two must be women. No, you know, we have 10 spots, two must be brown folks and two must be black folks. No, you know, it cannot be that. That is a box checking exercise. So you'll see us continue to have this dialogue. You'll see us continue to work on our own DE&I efforts and principles woven throughout the culture of both the volunteer staff, uh, volunteer side and the staff side, and our commitment, um, <laughs> you know, something. What my head of communications talks about a DEI army, you know, and I think at the end of the day, we have to also be careful to continue to meet people where they are, and everybody is in a different place on DEI. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what it means, and lastly, to that, I'll say, for me, wrapped around DEI is the notion that all are welcome. You don't have to have the D, the E, and the I to understand, hopefully, in my opinion, that all are welcome, regardless of gender, 
gender identification, religious beliefs, political beliefs, God knows in our country right now, that's, <laughs> that can be a differentiator at times, the color of a person's skin. Those things should matter not. What kind of person are you? What kind of experience do you have? Where do you come from? And I mean that literally and figuratively. Those are the things that matter in an all are welcome environment. And the DEI principles, those just have to be woven, continue to be woven into the fabric of the organization. Well, Peter, I have seen uh, significant and positive uh, improvements with the ASIS International ever since you've t- taken the helm uh, of, <laughs> of, of the CEO. And, and of course, uh, it, it takes a really great board to uh, move the needle forward. So I just want to compliment you on that. And I really appreciate you taking the time to help uh, educate the followers of Cop to Corporate all these great law enforcement professionals that are looking for what's next, what's the next chapter life after law enforcement. So if you don't follow me on uh, LinkedIn, please connect, Uh, please connect with Peter, Peter J. O'Neill. Hit subscribe on my YouTube channel, Cop to Corporate. And then until the next time, thank you and wishing you all the best. 